Hello, everybody. It's 3.30 here in Colorado, and it's time for a seminar. Welcome to the 2022 ACOM Seminar Series. Today, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Mavendra Dubé. He's a senior scientist at uh, Los Alamos National Lab, and he has been uh, leading atmospheric research for 25 years. Most recently, he has founded the Center for Aerosol Gas Forensic Experiments, CAFE, uh, his research uses field observations, laboratory measurements, models, and simulations to advance our system models and to improve climate change and air quality assessments. He has performed focused aerosol and trace gas measurements for in situ, remote, and satellite sensors to verify emissions and parameterization. His uh, state-of-the-art optical measurements show absorbing, uh, are, showed that absorbing aerosols from wildfire and fossil combustion play a key role in climate. Uh, he has developed uh, machine learning codes for uh, gas leak detection from remote sensing. And uh, he has been awarded with many accolades, the latest of which is an, an R&D 100 prize in 2019. And he has been an editor for uh, AGO Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics for over 12 years. Today, he's going to tell us about uh, how field observations can guide climate policy. And uh, I, rem I remind you that you can enter your questions in the space below the video uh, and uh, at any time uh, during the presentation. And I will read those questions at the end of the presentation to Dubé. Please, uh, Dubé, the floor is yours. Uh, take it away. Great. Uh, thank you, Alessandro. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be virtual. Um, anyway, so my name is Dubé. And, uh, Today, uh, uh, I will, I'm pretty pleased to give you a seminar on our work over the last five, six years. Uh, it's a fact that accelerating radiative forcing and climate change by human activities demand global action. Today, I will show how observations are critical for adaptation, mitigation, and predictions. Our research is funded by both fundamental and applied research programs that are shown here. First, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, postdocs, and particularly undergraduate students and graduate students who are shown in green, uh, whose research I will be uh, showcasing uh, to you today. As you know, at NCAR and National Labs, it's not small groups, but big, uh, big teams that, uh, that do a lot of field measurements and analysis. So I really am presenting you my, my team's work. The primary case for global warming is built on observational data. From Arenas to Keeling to Manabe, we have come a long way. Shown here is the Earth's radiation budget, where the sun provides about 340 watt per meter square incident energy. Human greenhouse gases trap, have trapped about three watt per meter square by IR absorption. Uh, and uh, aerosols have scattered about one and a half watt per meter square by reflecting sunlight. These net radiative fluxes are well measured now and do vary regionally. Given the complex nature of the Earth's system, observed signals of climate change over the past half century have played a key role in forming models. And this is growing as it approaches irreversible tripping points that are hard to predict, hence the importance of observations. So as you can see, we pumped in about 400 zettajoules uh, that has many positive feedbacks that we've uh, encountered and proven they're positive. And reasons, regions are changing at unprecedented rates and crushing thresholds. Uh, uh, and BAU business as usual will lock us to an eight and a half watt per meter square in 2100. So that's very disconcerting. Uh, the IPCC uh, uh, concerted has, uh, has uh, uh, suggested concerted global action that is needed to reduce radiative forcing and contain global warming to less than a degree and a half. Uh, this is shown here, highlighting the data uh, that show that the current rate of GHG release is untenable. The path includes reducing air pollution that's shown in blue, which would uh, exacerbate warming because aerosols are primarily cluning, decreasing methane this decade, shown in purple, slowing C CO2 emissions now and extracting uh, it from the air uh, to reduce it in the, uh, in the century. Monitoring is key to ensure that national policies and unknown feedbacks are working to attain this. So we're given the amount of forcing and the complexity in the system uh, sustained ongoing monitoring is, is our responsibility as we try to predict this complex system. 
So today uh, I will talk, uh, our climate system is very stiff and encompasses many timescales. So here I've, uh, uh, I've just highlighted topics I'll talk about on forcing them feedbacks and the timescales inherent in them. So fires emit aerosols, carbonaceous aerosols. Uh, they typically last uh, you know, a week or so, depending on how long the fire lasts and they affect radiation clouds, cooling and warming, et cetera. Fossil fuels uh, uh, emit, uh, uh, and food emits methane, for example, and CO2. And the methane, uh, here I'm gonna discuss Four Corners methane uh, case study, and also methane at dairies in California. Their lifetime is about a decade, so uh, they are significant on decadal uh, uh, scales, and, and action on that time scale uh, can uh, lead uh, uh, helpful uh, reductions. And the last I'll talk about is the Amazon carbon cycle, which again, the feedback share are centuries. So again, uh, there's a stiff problem with all of these time scales in encompassed in the climate system. Let me start with aerosols. Uh, 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 illustrated here are the complex aerosol emissions right from the sources, uh, anthropogenic and biogenic, to their fate and transport and cycles. Uh, uh, DOE's uh, Biological Environmental Research Program specializes in investigating aerosols in clouds, and they, they, they fund us, but these are very complicated as shown here. Uh, I will try to take a piece out of this, but it's, it's very uh, complex. And it's pretty much the Achilles heel in climate model predictions. Uh, despite this complexity, the IPCC AR6 distills by a synthesis of what the individual components of all of these forcing agents have been both in radiative forcing and in climate. And you can see uh, that since 7750, CO2 forcing of, has been about 2.1 per meter square with a 0.8 degree C contribution to warming. Methane on the other hand has been a, a, a one and a half watt per meter square with the 0.6 degree C warming and a 10 year time scale. Aerosols on the other hand have cooled by about one and a half watt per meter square uh, and their time cost is in a week. So this is again recognized uh, and, and the uncertainties are dominated by aerosols. Let me now hone in on black carbon uh, because while most aerosols cool climate, black carbon and its close cousin, brown carbon, which I'll talk about from biomass burning and fossil fuel combustion stands out as a potent warmer as it absorbs sunlight. It's mixing with other constituents and aging and complex is complex. And this has resulted in a wide range of forcings historically uh, going as high as 0.85 uh, watt per meter square. The latest IPCC recommends a mean forcing of about uh, 0.2 watt per meter square that ranges from minus 0.2 to plus half a watt per meter square. Uh, again, uh, a black carbon actually uh, has a lot of regional feedbacks. And so it's important to, um, uh, to appreciate that. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, current estimates of 0.2 watt per meter square do not Consider those, uh, BC can have very strong local to regional effects, for example, promoting snow melting, destabilizing the boundary layer, promoting cloud evaporation. So there are mechanistic things that are still uh, ill understood. Uh, the BC complexity needs us, our fundamental knowledge of complex BC production mechanism is pretty deep. Uh, it's in the domain of physical chemistry, uh, you know, and, and there are, you know, physical chemists in the audience, I'm sure. Uh, who like to understand the mechanisms, uh, but we need to capture it in a tractable manner. So here on the left-hand side is the mechanism of how radical reactions on heating, you know, wood or fuel uh, create, uh, a, you know, rings, uh, you know, of five to six member rings that start fusing in the hot zone uh, with low oxygen and eventually produce 25 nanometer level particles that then aggregate it to sub nanometer par particles to make fractal fluffy soot. So on the left is the mechanism that uh, nails pretty well down in, 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 in the flame environment where it's probed in situ at very high uh, temporal resolution. On the right is kind of uh, aged soot sample analyzed by SEM. And you can see the morphology is very complicated and as is their composition, they are not pure soot particles, they're coated with uh, various organics and they have shapes that are uh, important for optical properties. 
So we've done a, a lot of work uh, over the past uh, you know, five, six years to illuminate some of these things in a meaningful, meaningful manner. Let me see. Okay, so this BC need uh, th this BC complexity needs to be captured in a meaningful and tractable manner in models, and connected to observables for tuning, as is shown here. So I told you some physical chemistry. This is knowledge. The depth of the knowledge is pretty deep, but eventually we have to translate it into models. And the way it is done is uh, we actually measure these things. We first simplify. So as I'm showing, I've cartooned the fluffy stuff as a fractal. I've cartooned the organic uh, aerosols as a gray bar and brown carbon. In the atmosphere, all of these things mix and, and basically they can result into complex behavior that can be captured by simple theory, me theory. For example, the core shell enhances BC absorption. I'll talk to, to you about that. Uh, then uh, on the other hand, you can get compaction of these aggregates uh, that reduces the BC absorption. And then you can get brown carbon, which can actually uh, uh, absorb in the shorter wavelengths as shown on the right-hand side as measured by the air absorbing air angstrom exponent. We measure uh, extensive quantities with field instruments, scattering absorption and extinction. We also measure intensive properties like single scatter albedo, angstrom exponents for both scattering. Uh, so that allows us to dissect this kind of meaningful complexity that models can, can uh, use to, to parameterize. The first example that I would summarize uh, is, um, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is kind of uh, looking at, uh, let me just go back one more slide. Okay, so yeah, as I summarize here today, I will talk. So we, we went from complex fusing rings to these uh, larger scale morphologies uh, that, that, that control the interaction of sunlight and, uh, and black carbon and organic carbon. So the first thing that we, uh, we did, and we learned this, uh, uh, yeah, you can see. So yeah, here shown here is the mechanistic finding from laboratory fires. So during the flame campaign, we measured a lot of uh, wildfire smoke in the lab uh, in Montana and uh, uh, many, many burns. And what we discovered is that there is a common mechanism, the same mechanism that produces black carbon also produces brown carbon. And this is shown here as the imaginary part of the refractive index of 550 nanometer, very high AAE. And the simple finding was that both BC and BRC are, are, are produced by a common mechanism. We developed an empirical relationship uh, deriving brown carbon from BC. And this allowed us to put this in, 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 in uh, climate models as Brown et al. did in CAM5 and E3SM. And the summary of that finding is the global radiative forcing of brown carbon in wildfires is about 0.3 watt per meter square. That is about half of the BC. So again, these meaningful approximations uh, set empirically allow us to say something more definitive about a more complex system that is hard to um, predict from first principles. The other issue that we looked at in much detail and largely driven by measurements is, as I showed you uh, earlier, if you coat black carbon with uh, transparent organic coatings, you can enhance the absorption uh, by lensing. And this is basically scattering theory. Uh, the beauty is we can now have instruments that can measure both the black carbon mass, particle mass, its size, and the coating thickness using these optical techniques where you get uh, a laser, high power laser that scatters the light, you get the scattering, you get the size. It also, uh, the light is absorbed by black carbon at the core that glows and basically emits black body hot radiation and you can measure that. So it's very well uh, calibrated. Now in the bottom, I'm showing you there's some basic numbers. One is the mass absorption cross-section of bare black carbon is relatively well known. It's about four, nine meters per gram in the, in the blue and five in the, in the, in the red. And so uh, shown in the middle panel is kind of lab studies we did in 2010, where we systematically took control size of black carbon in the lab and we coated it with thin organic coatings or varied the size. And you can clearly see this effect of lensing in the lab over well-known samples and control samples is pretty clear. You get enhanced absorption at all wavelengths of about a factor of two and a half uh, uh, you know, at, at, the, at 150 nanometer coating. So this effect is real, 
On the right hand side, uh, following that, there were many field campaigns. And the picture in the nature is more complex. So you can see many points in the urban areas do not exhibit uh, enhanced absorption as the lab study showed, but some do. And the some that do are generally in the biomass burning domain. So again, uh, nature is more complicated uh, than the lab uh, and one has to be careful and correct for those nuances there. So the other thing we did to follow up on that finding is uh, dug in deeper into uh, mixing state of wildfire plumes. So we actually interrogated at Los Alamos uh, 21 wildfire smoke plumes over a wide range of ages, which is coating. So as a, as a smoke plume ages, it coats. And you can see that in cartoon here uh, in the data where you have the BC equilibrium size on the horizontal axis. And then you have a measure of the coating to BC on a volume to volume basis. You can see the fresh smoke is very thinly coated. And as you go to uh, aged coats, uh, uh, aged coatings, they get much more thickly coated. Uh, the me theory will tell you that the enhancement shown on the top is very dependent on the pore size uh, and, the, and the coating thickness. So me theory captures that dependence. We use that, but now with data, because we had the size of solutions, both the core size and the coating. And we were basically in the middle, you can see that the observed absorption uh, in, the, in the field uh, at LANL correlates very, very well with the uh, measured absorption using photoacoustic. Uh, then you can go next and you can see what is the enhanced absorption. And you can see clearly that if you do the size resolved non-uniform coating that you measure, your me theory works very well. So this uh, framework where we had a, uh, we're now lo uh, looking at particle resolved mixing and coating, uh, we put this, um, uh, all the data together in the color shown on the right hand side, this E apps, and we fit it using an empirical function, which is shown in the gray. And on the black lines is what people models do currently, meaning they use a uniform uh, approximation. And you basically can see there is a 20 to 40% high bias in absorption uh, enhancements in current models because of the approximation that everything is uniformly coded, which is not the case. So we suggest that these new, um, uh, the absorption is still significantly enhanced uh, because it's a factor of one and a half, but it's not as much as models do. So we need to revisit these forcings uh, using E3SM and MAM4 that actually do prognostically track coding thicknesses. Now I've talked a little bit about um, about um, uh, um, uh, uh, organic coatings and dry environment, which is easier to measure and encountered in fires. However, the same uh, physics and phenomenology applies to wet aerosols. So if you have black carbon and other species that mix with inorganics, they become hydrophilic and they can soak up water. In fact, in the middle panel, you can see this absorption enhancement shown in color in the NASA GIS model. And you can see far from the sources, uh, black carbon obviously gets far away. You have a very significant enhancement over the oceans in the bright yellows of factor two. And that's associated with uh, black carbon coated with water coatings. However, this is very hard to measure and very ill-constrained. So we actually develop an instrument that is a much more gentle measure. It measures extinction and scattering and uses the absorption as a difference. So it's, a, it's not a laser-based technique, it uses a lamp, so it's very gentle, so the water doesn't evaporate. So we built this capability and we're beginning to sort of address the water enhancement issues. Uh, we actually, in the lab, uh, uh, looked at uh, uh, nigrosin, which is a soluble surrogate of black carbon and ammonium sulfate, which is also uh, uh, soluble, more soluble than nigrosin. And as you can see here, we have plotted our laboratory results on size selected uh, nitro nigrosin ammonium sulfate mixtures of various composition. I've plotted the increase in scattering, which occurs because of growth, versus the increase in absorption, which is a new uh, measure. And you can see pure nigrosin is an increase of about five to seven percent uh, with the humidity. Uh, at high humidity. Uh, when you mix the two ammonium sulfate and nitrate one to one, you get some interesting turnover, but still the absorption goes up. And the same for a ammonium sulfate and nitrate. So uh, this is one of the first direct measures of absorption enhancement from absorbing aerosols. Uh, switching gears a little bit, we also look at this issue of brown carbon is very, very complex. So we've begun testing surrogates in the lab of brown carbon. And here we looked at sunset yellow 
para red and fluorescent sodium salts. It's a pretty complex uh, 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 slide, but if you look at the uh, at the middle, we actually measured the single scatter albedo and the refractive index across the actinic wavelengths. And you can see from the structure that these dyes uh, absorb at different wavelengths. Uh, on the right hand side is the effect of relative humidity as well. The key point here is now for these uh, dyes of known structure, we were able to develop a multivariate aromatic model and functional groups trained on sort of the organic physical chemistry of spectroscopy, my fat past field. And we're able to actually begin to test on these more complicated uh, species. Our hope is this will apply directly to brown carbon surrogates, sort of eff effective brown carbon, as we're extracting a lot of chemical structural information on brown carbon from field campaigns. So I will summarize that significant radiative forcing by BC from wildfire smoke is currently biased high, but can be accurately assessed in climate model models by empirical parameterization developed uh, using ambient observations as I show. Absorption enhancements about 20% were observed on nigrosin, 15% at high humidity. We just concluded Tracer CAT campaign in July uh, in, in Houston, where we actually measured uh, soot absorb relative humidity effects of soot absorption. And we're seeing numbers that are similar to what we saw in the lab. Uh, and again, finally, the predictive model for BRC refractive index using structure spectral relationship is promising. Let me now switch my gears to methane. And uh, 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 that has risen at record rates over the past two years after a pause in the early 2000s. So you can see this sort of exponential rise in the recent epoch and a pause in the, in the 2000s. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, the annual changes occur, the, the, the annual changes in methane increases are in the five to 15 parts per billion uh, range as, as, as shown in the middle. That amounts to about 10 to 40 terograms of methane per year. This variability is within the realm of reductions in vision for methane to stabilize the global temperature of less than one and a half C as I opened and I show you on the right. Uh, and also meet our global uh, methyl trend. So, you know, if you're seeing this natural variability of that scale, I think influencing it by concerted action and reducing emissions from say oil and gas are definitely uh, uh, doable and should be prioritized. Uh, the challenges, as you all know, methane has a short lifetime, uh, 10 years. It's got a complex source mix and, and, and they all contribute to the global rise. Uh, it has a 20 year global warming potential of 84, which means if you reduce methane in the near term, you will have relatively immediate impact. So it builds confidence and you can see detectable changes in the decline in radiation forcing rate. As you can see on the right hand side, uh, methane is evenly split between natural sources uh, on the top and human sources in the bottom. So it's about a 50-50 split. Uh, uh, in the human sources, fossil and, 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 and food, uh, namely domestic ruminants and cattle are the big ones. So I think uh, we currently are going after the oil and gas and coal sector because that's a clear waste, although people are capturing methane and dairy, et cetera. So I will just describe very quickly a, a work that we did uh, in 2014. We used coarse satellites, Kiyamaki data, and found ground-based solar spectroscopy, TCON data, to discover the methane hotspot that is shown on the right, uh, uh, right-hand side. On left is the daily profile of total column methane at our site over two years that shows a 50 ppb enhancement at 10 a.m. driven by winds and source location. That's there. It's kind of a, a pretty stubborn and, and, and persistent uh, signal. Um, so we modeled this using the Edgar emissions in the region. And as you can see in the middle panel, uh, the Edgar emissions failed to re reproduce this amplitude, this 50 ppb spike. We had to scale the emissions by a factor of three to match that results. So uh, 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 EPA actually took note of this uh, finding and um, revised the emissions upward of by a factor of three. So uh, uh, clearly we have changed the trajectory for reporting and, and, and top-down ver verification is increasingly more prominent. Let me now shift to dairies. Uh, we have evaluated dairy emissions in California shown here to be large in the Central Valley. We used a portable, portable solar spectrometer similar to the TCON 
to measure total column methane upwind and downwind of the dairy clusters as shown here, noting that the meteorology uh, is much more complex than visualized here. Prior emissions with WARF uh, uh, validated by wind data and stilt analysis were used uh, and adjusted to determine top-down prior posterior. So you know we do a model exercise, we get the WARF stilts prior, and then we start um, uh, looking at uh, at uh, posterior. So, so this is just a technique. I, I skimmed over it, but essentially we are top looking satellites. Satellites look at backscattered sunlight. We look directly at the sun, sun and get total column, you know, methane, uh, CO2, N2O, etc. Uh, and the our, our, our precision is a is a lot higher. In fact, TCON and EM27s are used as a standard for satellites to tie to the WMO in situ standard. So here's what we did. I'm just showing you the, the location and there are stars. Uh, we had three instruments, so we moved them around. Two were at the same location, the other uh, moved around. And I'm showing you uh, prevailing winds that, that do change a little bit that uh, poses some challenges for inversions. Uh, here I'm just comparing the measured and the a plus the optimized after Bayesian inversion to fit the data. And you can see for most of the days, there is pretty good agreement between the optimized and the observed. On some days, there is not. And that is uh, attributed and diagnosed to complex meteorology. So the, the, the key finding for us uh, here uh, is uh, shown here. And these are the optimized of posterior derived emissions. And as I said, I didn't clarify this to you, but we were able to span four seasons. So we went July, September, January, uh, and, and February. So uh, we spanned the seasons. And you can see that uh, our, our results are consistent with other top-down uh, tower-based measurements. However, what leaps out here is that our winter emission is very high. So we see infer a lot higher winter emissions that are likely attributable to, to more a wetter environment in the winter uh, and the summer is, is lower. Uh, again, most models uh, that, that estimate the methane emissions from dairies only use the temperature scale factor. So this uh, uh, behooves the uh, question to go back uh, and relook at those dependencies. Uh, the lastly, I'll come back to four corners. Recently, we were able to deploy uh, mobile sensors uh, at four corners, same place where we discovered the hot, pot, hot spot. And here, what I'm showing you, we actually went and looked at different plants. The, the big one, the vent is the coal vent shaft. That's the big, big source. And then there were other things uh, like uh, oil and gas facilities and, and oil gas fields. And you can see that the excess ethane to methane ratio is very different for all of these sources. So it basically spanned from about 1.2% for the coal vent mine shaft to almost 14% uh, to some gas plants and in between. A uh, couple of key findings is the coal mine shaft, we've monitored it now for almost 10 years and that number 1.2% is stable. So a, a large source like that is very stable that gives us a, a, a opportunity to disentangle it uh, in the future, et cetera. Uh, the other finding that is not shown here, but was obvious to us is uh, Frankenberg published a paper after our original paper and found a lot of leaks. And one leak was a big gas plant that actually after it was reported, the state uh, got involved and that leak we went to look for it is gone. So when you report leak and measure, good things do happen because there's accountability. So I will not read this, but uh, in summary, uh, we, we, I think top-down measurements are important for verification. Uh, again, it's very important to understand the, the environmental, uh, certainly water dependencies on methane emissions from dairy. And again, ethane methane is now being used to attribute national source uh, and monitoring and reporting works. I will, in the last section of my talk, uh, how much time do I have, Alessandro? Almost done, right? <laughs> 20, I will 20 just, minutes, 20, uh, 20 minutes. Oh, okay, so I'm doing okay. I'll, I'd like to slow down and give you another. So I've covered aerosols, black carbon, I've covered methane a little bit, and I hope I've highlighted the importance of measurements uh, in feeding models, uh, you know. Let me now switch gears to uh, the carbon cycle. And this is a field campaign that we did with DOE support 
uh, in the Amazon, uh, you know, several years ago, and with many partners. Uh, and I'd like to just give you the uh, highlight you the ba basic message. So as you all know, shown here is currently about half of the CO2 is taken up by the biosphere, quarter by the terrestrial plants and quarter by the oceans on a global scale. Okay. Uh, and again, uh, you know, we don't quite know what the fate of the carbon cycle will be as we warm the planet, you know, uh, deforest warming, you know, dehydration, hydration, all types. So I think, I think there's a lot of uncertainty when it comes to carbon cycle responses. Uh, the Amazon forest stores about 200 petagrams of carbon that cycles about 19 petagrams for carbon per year. There's a lot of cycling with an inferred uptake of about half a petagram per year from 1990 to 2007. So it's been a sink for carbon and clearly its future uh, evolution needs to be better understood because it'll impact CO2. Uh, again, the processes at daily seasonal decadal time scales from fires, ecology and land use change are all coupled and the models try to capture it. So I'll try to see how we can make a contribution to that. So that's what motivated our thing. We have a storm here, so uh, it's a heavy monsoon here. <laughs> okay, so again, I showed you the mini EM27. Uh, this is the same instrument, except it's very, very high resolution. It's shown in that container. It's autonomous, meaning it ran itself with minimal interference. The dome would open and close when the sun was out uh, and would close when the rain, uh, it rained and at night. And what this does is it looks at the solar spectrum. It was also calibrated by airborne uh, uh, profiles. So, uh, so that it's pretty, pretty uh, precise. And we measure uh, the CO2, CO, methane, nitrogen, water, and HOD. Okay. Let me just give you a, 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 a overview of the, of the results. So here is the annual cycle and the total column over Manaus, Brazil, over the wet uh, rainforest. So the top is water, uh, mil, then is N2O, then is CO, then is methane and CO2. So we, we clearly see the expected cycle, the dry, wet, dry in our water results. So you can see that precipitation is also, that's not a surprise. So we capture the seasons. Uh, we also see the high CO in the dry fire season uh, and also the high methane and N2O in the wet season. So you can see that trend. The CO2 cycle as shown on the bottom is a little bit more complex uh, because it depends on the secular rise of global CO2 on biomass burning and also on forest growth sort of leaf phenology that, you know, leaf shedding and regrowth. So that was the uh, topic of interest. So let me disentangle the two. So we disentangled them here. In the red is the original data. We subtracted out the secular trend uh, and also use CO as a surrogate to subtract out the biomass buyer term. And you left with the black cycle, which is now the biogenic plus transport cycle meaning is the uh, breathing in of the CO2 and out uh, in the biosphere and also the transport that's coming from, you know, Northern hemisphere and, and latitudes uh, and lower latitudes. So again, the seasonal cycle here is about a 2.64 PPA. Then what we did is we have uh, a lot of transport models that are being used and we were able to, uh, and this is again, work done by many others, part of the OCO2-3 team. And they ran the model over that Brazil. So you can see here, uh, without going into a lot of details, five of the seven models do a very good job in simulating the data that's in black. Uh, you know. So again, uh, uh, you know, this transport versus local effects seem to be at least coarsely well in the net CO2 well, ex well explained in the model. What was unique here is um, we actually had data on shorter time scales, meaning we were measuring CO2 drawdown every day. Every day, the CO2 would draw down to almost from anywhere from two to four ppm every day because of photosynthesis. So this drawdown is shown in green, the PDF, and you can see the mean drawdown for PECON that we measured was 2.1 ppm. And this is from photosynthesis. All the other models that are shown here in different colors, uh, uh, predict the too feeble a drawdown, uh, basically a factor of four lower. So again, this tells us that the models are not capturing the photosynthetic behavior of the forest. And if they're not doing right, that right, I think it's fair to question if they're gonna do the long-term response uh, uh, of the, of the uh, tropical 
rainforest. So, uh, so this is good uh, that we, we were able to uh, uh, diagnose that. So again, to summarize this, column X CO2 observations in the Amazon rainforest show that the seasonal cycle is a sum of the biogenic cycle of 2.3 ppm, half a ppm transport and model, uh, minus one ppm biomass burning, and two and a half ppm is the trend. Uh, implies a net CO2 sink in 2014-15 in the wet Manaus region, and the mean photosynthetic drawdown was a minus 2.1 ppm. Again, the daily photosynthetic drawdown is too low by a factor of four, demonstrating that models do not partition the respiration and uptake correctly, which means more work needs to be done in refining photosynthetic models because the rainforest is vulnerable. Uh, how am I doing on time, Alessandro? 15 more minutes, 10 more minutes. Oh, I, uh, I went pretty fast. Okay. Yeah, I you, you, you yeah, blasted right. through. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to cover a lot, of, a lot of ground, and I'm glad I did. I usually am not, not able to make this far. So I can answer questions. I, the spirit of my talk was to, you know, we've, we've done a lot of modeling. The climate system is very complex. We're adding a lot more things. But I think now is the time to begin to look at data and incorporate data. Uh, we recently published a paper on the Arctic amplification, just looking at the human record. And what this plot is showing is that the Arctic has warmed faster than the globe since the mid 1980s. This is just regression analysis, very simple. We've only also analyzed CMIP models, but I want to keep this single. What you can see here clearly is even as the Arctic has warmed faster than the globe, the A has increased to four in this century. So that's even a rapid. And this has been attributed a little bit for the AMO natural variability and the secular changes being in phase. And, uh, and CMIP six models and many models are unable to capture that because natural variability is kind of a little bit hard thing. So uh, here again, I'm showing this. And, and, and the other thing to note is these shifts tend to be abrupt, meaning you can see on the right-hand plot, plot the shifts of this amplification are abrupt and not uh, gradual. And this can go either way because a couple of decades ago, we were talking about a pause in global warming. So understanding the, the, the phasing in of natural variability with the secularly rise is important. And this even more important because if you're in phase in 10 years, you can push the system over a tipping point. So I think it's important to look at data to diagnose that. Uh, I'm going to close a little bit uh, very quickly with something that we've been doing recently, and we're living through an era of mega fires. As you all know, uh, over the last five years, we've had intense pyrocumulus storms, and I'm highlighting the specific Northwest event and the Australian uh, event on the top. These events are so big that these pyrocumulus inject smoke into the lower stratosphere. And so, and those can have dramatic smoke that can last for you know, six months to a year, depending on how it goes. So we're beginning to probe this using models and measurements. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this in a lot of data, but these are LES models that show how pyrocumulus forms. So you, you need a dry boundary layer so you can have a fire, but then you need a moist uh, mid troposphere. So you can convectively loft these uh, plumes by, by pyrocumulus formation, ice formation. And that can basically allow these things to inject to the lower stratosphere. Uh, there's obviously a lot of microphysics embedded here that DOE does. So we actually have a lot of microphysics in the middle that is responsible for this latent heat pumping. And on the right hand side, there's chemistry that we're beginning to discover. And that is there's a lot of gases uh, volatile and condensable gases in the uh, in these plumes that actually begin to condense in the cold outdraft of pyrocumulus, and we now have signals uh, using uh, data, field data that actually can can show some of this. So what we've been doing really is trying to put this all together uh, in a model. Uh, these are kind of informed models. We we have Lanel has very high fidelity fire models. We run those. For this, uh, for this domain. Then we have uh, these LES models that do the pyrocumulus. And then we drive E3SM or CESM with these models. I'll just give you a few key results that we've discovered that are recently uh, published or soon to publish. The first is that when you loft these plumes, this is a plot of height versus aerosol amount. And you can see that you have primary aerosols, the emissions, then because of dynamics and winds, you lost some dust that settles down. But most importantly, we have this secondary organic aerosol grid, and that's the condensable gases that we can empirically account for. 
The key point here is this kind of uh, SOA and this uh, water interaction pumps up the plume by about five kilometers. So this plume lofting, how does it get that high? Uh, aerosol uh, water interactions are critical for that. So we've kind of shown that, probably one of the first to demonstrate that with modeling and data. And on the right-hand side is this other concept, is once this plume gets into the lower stratosphere, uh, it's pretty intact, decoupled from the free troposphere or the troposphere. And there it basically, because it has black carbon and absorbing stuff, it gets heated by the sun and self lofts So basically because heating. And so this shows you the self lofting both in the model and in the data and the purple. And we're able to kind of uh, match those two things. So we're beginning to uh, exquisitely tune the BC content of the plume and match the plume rise as observed by satellites. The last thing people ask is, well, I mean, these are big fires. Uh, you could see the smoke from satellites all over, but did they have a discernible effect on climate? And to do that, we ran some uh, ensemble runs. And you can see on the right-hand side that uh, the surface radiation definitely had a big reduction in the first, this is time versus radiation in the first, you know, uh, less than six months. So you had a three watt per meter square perturbation, and then it adjusted uh, up and forth in the ensemble. Same with the temperature. Actually, we feel that if for the, the temperature, the cooling from the Australian fires is resolvable, meaning it's of the order of like 0.25 degrees or so in the first uh, half of a uh, half a year or so. Now, this is important, and this paper is published by Gennaro DeAngelo et al. This is important because this is a natural analog for nuclear winter. And, and, and whereas the fluxes are, 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 are much lower, uh, there is a mechanistic connection. So that's why we, we are doing this work. The other issue is of the smoke lifetime because that was also very well measured and we can measure the mass by satellite data. And you can see the total smoke Flu mass for the Australian fire was about 1.6 teragrams. Uh, stratospheric mass was about 0.8 teragrams. This was four times the British Columbia fire. Uh, again, the, the bottom line here is that the lifetime of the Australian fires was a lot longer than the British Columbia fires because of this self lofting by black carbon. The, the New South Wales fire actually uh, rose a lot higher than the British Columbia. And this is, uh, uh, you know, this is an important finding relative to having rules of if you have a stratospheric plume, volcano or otherwise, or geoengineering for that matter. And I think I wanted to close with that is, you know, this work that we've done has had an interesting history. It was promoted to understand, you know, the potential possibility of nuclear winter. And we used Hiroshima as an as a, as a example, for example, for self-lofting. It included pyro sea beef in our study, but now people are talking about cloud seeding and volcanic impacts and, uh, and geoengineering. And so I think uh, the science that we're doing uh, feeds many, many applications and concerns. So I will stop there and uh, take questions. Awesome, thank you so much. That was uh, really a, a very wide, uh, like a talk, it talked touching really many, many aspects of, uh, of uh, atmospheric science. Um, while we wait for, um, for questions coming, coming through Slido, um, I was interested in, um, I think it's slide 15, uh, where you show the, the instrument that uh, measures uh, lensing from uh, water. Okay. Yeah, so um, let me, I think I can explain it, I don't need this slide. So that, so the instrument, there are two instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, one measures the mixing state of black carbon on a single particle basis. And the instrument essentially is a high pyre laser, um, uh, I think it's 1064. And it basically has enough power that it, the black carbon absorbs the light and heats up and eventually evaporates, glows. But since we know the black carbon heat, heat capacity very well, we can calibrate out the incandescence temperature and that's how they calibrate. And you can do it empirically. 
The other thing it does, it measures scattering before it heats up. So the first signal is scattering from the outer shell. So that gives you the size. So it gives you the size, the black carbon mass, and the black carbon core shell. So th there's four sensors. So it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it's a pretty nifty instruments diagnostics that's been used now by many, many people all the time. So it's a pretty, uh, yeah. So that's how we get the black carbon coating thickness and the mass mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and, the, and the core size. Then you have another instrument, which typically is either a photoacoustic that measures the direct absorption and scattering. There's another way of doing it, which is called a cavity attenuated phase shift spectrometer that's also commercial that measures scattering and extinction and the difference is absorption. Now that's the one we use for humidity because uh, it's a subtle effect. If you use photoacoustic, you can't use photoacoustic at high humidity because of the heating. So uh, those two instruments combined give us this uh, understanding of lensing, et cetera. Does yeah, the, yeah the, um, the one, the one for that the measures water is, is very interesting. It's the first time I, I, hear, I hear about it. I mean, the other, the first one you describe is the SP2, right? Yeah, that is the SP2. Yeah, yeah. The SP2 is, yeah. Yeah, and that, that one I, I, I know it's, it's, it's been around for, for a while. Uh, but um, the, the other one that you said you, you, you guys use a lamp is more gentle too. Yeah. Uh, and those curves also were very, very interesting, very non-linear non responses. Yeah. Uh, for uh, when you use nigrosine and uh, ammonium sulfate combinations, those are pretty interesting and uh, yes, and that not, turnover, not obvious. Yeah, the no, explanation. Obvious. You have to do a lot of math uh, and looking at me theory and size dependence and the kappa. So there, there's a model that we build that couples kappa color theory for the growth rate. Ammonium sulfate is much more hydrophilic than black carbon or nigrosin even. And so you need to have a model like this kappa color theory. But eventually we have to develop simple mixing rules. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to develop a mixing rule. Yeah. Okay. okay. I've, I've got questions from people I recognize and know. Yeah. Eric. <laughs> so Eric says, understanding methane trends, oops, understanding methane trends over the years has proved challenging. It's good that some of the oil and gas companies are on board with supporting more regulations, but the isotope signatures may be indicating the recent rise. Yes, Eric, you are correct. The recent rise, and I think Ed has uh, papers on that from Noah. The recent rise and the drop in Del-13, I think, suggests that biogenic, most likely tropical wetlands have played a role mm. in that. So I think you're right. Uh, I think the fear is that coming back to my comment of we need to do more continuous monitoring, we can't just predict. I would say uh, we haven't seen a dramatic rise in global CO2 from Arctic, but that is a big concern, meaning the moment we can see even a small amount of global signal is coming from the Arctic, it's kind of analogous to the ozone hole. You better get your act together. So I think having robust monitoring all over the globe uh, is important, particularly in the Arctic, where we're still pretty limited. Coming down to the oil and gas, absolutely. I think oil and gas companies will not change their business model. Oil and gas fundamentally is a wasteful industry. They dig a hole, they only get 5% of the oil, and of the oil and gas they connect, they basically throw 40% away. And they've been doing business in that case for 100 years. So the externalities are key, so the push from top down will come. I work with them, I think it's great technology is coming, but unless you prove and point that this is a problem, this won't move forward. I would say agriculture is also something that needs to be in the frame because agriculture is a big part for methane. So I hope, uh, Eric, I've answered your questions. Okay, I had another one from Shima. Oh, okay, are pyro CBs cooling warming in the short long scale? I think at least the ensemble runs were they were cooling. Now they do warm the stratosphere. <laughs> so there's definitely a bigger stratospheric signal which has its own chemistry. And I think Susan Solomon had a paper on this pyrocumulus impact on ozone, NOx and others. So I think there is stratospheric impulse, but I think they do cool uh, in, the, in the short to long term. And that's why there's concern, the analogs for nuclear winter because 
it's first it's, it's first shading you first block sunlight so it's shading following by the physical effects of shading which is cooling and obviously plants so yeah another one You know, I, I think one shouldn't get carried away by uncertainties. We as scientists just focus on uncertainties. And what I'm learning from the oil and gas and other policy is give them thresholds. I mean, tell them high, medium, and low, and give them an option to fix it. So I would say here, Doug, this is my friend, Doug. Doug, I think it's good to give them a number they can act on. Otherwise, they will push it back on you, right? You have to give it a clear number that this is high and this is low and medium. And, and I think in the methane business, we are there. We can find big leaks from, huge leaks from satellites already. I mean, uh, and then, you know, there are small leaks from abandoned oil and gas wells that are slowly spewing out, you know, at some rate, we don't know. But the numbers are huge and the time is good. So I wouldn't say we don't need to ignore them, but the low, low hanging fruit or the fat tail <laughs> is pretty obvious and we're going out there. But there are some gaps, meaning I don't think we know a very good contribution of abandoned orphan wells uh, and stuff like that that we're going after, especially in DOE. So uh, I, I think quantification is needed. In fact, this new IRA Inflation Reduction, Reduction Act uh, mandates a methane intensity of 0.2%, 0.2%, meaning you can only leak 0.2% of the methane you sell. And that's pretty stringent given the numbers I told you 40% in the old days, which nobody knows. And now if you look at top down, they're coming around 4%. I mean, so that's a big, uh, big thing. So uh, I think we need to focus on actionable as we keep doing the science. And I, I think I'm, I'm optimistic if the administration sustains and the policy persists, we will get movement uh, in this direction. It has to happen in the US. I mean, it's not going to happen in Russia or, or Kazakhstan. It's going to happen here. Uh, and same with agriculture. If you look at Southeast, uh, the rice paddies, I don't have the solution for agriculture, but fossils is the first thing to go after. Another question? I think I answered, oh, flat 10 and early two. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, there's a paper on this uh, and I, I think, the, I mean, there are various scenarios. One scenario has been the something to do with Russia, again, the Russian economy and this hypothesis that you can test that the Russian split up created a dip in emissions there or production. Uh, there could also be variations in OH. I didn't mention that, but small changes in OH can change the lifetime enough that they'll show up. But I think nobody quite understands. The, that aspect. So that's why we need regional scale measurements, either in basin or the Arctic, to go after the methane budget. So, good question, but I, I don't have an answer. For the use of multi scale fire simulations, where are the weakest links and what do you see as the I, needs for infra infrastructure? Do we have the connections we need to go from fire tech to pyro CB to ESM? It's a, it's a very hard problem. I, I think the key, I mean, I think one has to look at probabilities. Uh, the problem with pyro CB is you can do a good job with the emissions, which is hard enough with fire tech or other models or wharf even. Uh, pyro CB actually requires certain unique meteorological conditions, uh, humidity, et cetera, uh, in the upper atmosphere. And uh, so I would say, I mean, if I was to, I would say this has to actually, if you want to assess pyro CB, et cetera, you need to run in a forecast mode, meaning uh, it's, it, 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 you know, so trying to do it, and sometimes they will go up and sometimes they may not. So I think forecasting becomes, it's sort of analogous to a hurricane formation intensification. Meaning once you have a fire, yes, you have a possibility of having a pyrocumulus. Uh, uh, does the pyrocumulus penetrate the stratosphere? Then you need more information. So I would say, I, I, would, I would draw an analogy to what we do for hurricanes, uh, doing the same for pyrocumulus and other events that of that scale that way we are prepared, you know, uh, and, you know, anything can happen. You just have to make sure the probability is important. 
Next question. Nuclear war is likely to include urban fires and potentially firestorms. Do you have any thoughts on how the smoke from these fires would contrast with those you have looked uh, for pyro CBs cases? Uh, black carbon concentration, injection heights, etc. Yeah, Chuck, I know you work in this field, so thanks for the question. Um, you know, I mean, I think we know a lot more about fire emissions. Unfortunately, until recently, uh, forced by tragedies uh, in the wild uh, under uh, fires in the wildland herbal interface where we lost lives and property, we have now begun to look at building materials. So I think, uh, uh, you know, in nuclear winter, most likely the targets are urban uh, buildings, et cetera. So we need much more information on the types of fuels, the emission factors, et cetera. So that's an important thing. And some, some have high uh, BC, some have low BC, and some have not combust. So, so I think that a short answer is we need to really have a good data set. And actually at Los Alamos, we're beginning to do that. So we're burning plastics, PVCs, uh, building materials to get that thing. Uh, injection height, probably we can do a good job. Again, here again, forecasting meteorology like humidity matters. So you get five kilometer pumps due to pyrocumulus action. And you know that's an important predictor if you get the plume up five kilometers. So trying to, uh, my, my recommendation, Chuck, would be this thing has to be used more data on urban materials, urban fuels, which has been not really well characterized. And also uh, forecast so we can better project the injection uh, height uh, reanalysis mode. So, and I think we're there yet. I, I think, I think I mean, especially now with all the concerns about nuclear, I think we can have the tools if we have the resources to do this forecasting. There's no fixed rule. It'll depend. It'll depend on the meteorologic condition, the, the the fuel type in the city, how big the blast is, and 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 give you probabilities, right? So we can be bet. Any comments on not accounting for BRC forcing on recent IPCC? Okay. I mean, you know, I mean, I, my, my, my thing is, you know, I mean, I think, you know, if you look at BC, BC coding effects, I mean, all these mechanisms are within a factor or two <laughs> of each other, right? And, and, and we got to really carefully do that. I think BRC forcing is important. I think it should be studied. But I think, as I've learned from BC, clearly when it becomes a topic of policy interests, uh, you know, you've got a forcing of big forcing. And I, I think BC is important because it does have local effects that we don't understand. But BC forcing was as high as almost 0.9 watt per meter square. Now IPCC is going to 0.2. Uh, I don't know. I think it'll be, I'd, I'd be happy to, I mean, what I want to do is getting, I mean, there are max now being published, mass absorption co coefficients for effective organic. So, you know, you have a lot more organics. You can separate them, so you know, but you can measure them. So you use an effective max. So uh, I'm not going to comment on IPC report. I, I'd like to see more observations in IPCC. So uh, from that rate, I will say yeah, I'd like to see all these things. But yeah, thanks for noting. I hadn't noted that, that they don't do BRC. But BRC has gotten its attention. I'm not saying they're lacking for funding. Uh, next question. I didn't answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, here. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Um, WRT methane, even during Frappe, we had results showing 50% of methane being attributable to CFOs. What are CFOs? Which, They're not UFOs, are they? Right. I don't know, Frank. What are CFOs? Frank, what are CFOs? He's typing CFOs. Yeah. I don't understand the CI is my acronym. Yeah, it also escapes me as well. CFOs, maybe. Uh, yeah, I, I do say I've been reading a little papers in the UNTA, and you know, they're still high. The fraction of emission is high, but the total, is, what is here? Oh, cattle and feed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I did that in, the, yeah, in a cattle, and, and, and this is where, I mean, in California for sure. 
I mean, Frappe was capital. here in the front range. Okay, and I'm sure it is there, but it's more heterogeneous, right? You got a much more, well, much more homogenized mixture of oil and cattle. Whereas in, in California, there's a big center and then there's oil and gas outside. So I, I won't be surprised. I think, I think agriculture is a pretty big source of, and I, I'm sure you know better, uh, yeah. But I, yeah, this is not surprising. I mean, we're, in, our, in our dairy, we're dominated by, by cattle. I mean, and you can do the numbers, they're pretty significant. I think globally, uh, food, uh, cattle and, 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 um, and uh, rice, et cetera, are like 40%. They're a little bit bigger than the fossil. And that therein lies the challenge and there is lies the opportunity, how can you advance those things? Because you got to feed everybody first, then you can, you know, then you can worry about climate, right? All right. That was great. Thank you so much for the great talk and the interactive uh, uh, Q&A part. Um, and thanks for everybody who tuned in and listened to the talk and asked questions. Um, see you next time, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. And if John Orlando is still there or around, uh, happy retirement. I know a lot of people there. It's, uh, it's uh, Jeff Tyndall. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, not John, uh, Jeff Tuna. Uh, Je Je Jeff Tyndall. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, all I mean, right. I, I'm their compatriot. So, okay. Thank you all. I appreciate your hosting. And it's a pleasure to be able to share thoughts. Thank you. Yeah.